I'm not sure that um, formal storytelling is exactly my métier, but uh, having a group of people together like this is an opportunity to tell a story which puzzles me, which is I think all good stories should be puzzling, and all myths that are uh, authentic and haven't been rewritten for daytime television uh, maintain a kind of dreamlike, surreal quality. And uh, so I'd like to tell you a story that I came upon uh, a few months ago and was delighted. And I tell it to you in the hope that you can perhaps help me to understand it. Uh, like all good stories, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But I felt that there must be something important in it because I, it was very easy to memorize. <laughs> so that clued me to the fact that there must be something in it. And this story comes from uh, that ultimately pivotal moment in Western civilization when uh, the last outpost of the goddess culture, which was uh, Crete, Minoan Crete, fell and was in the process of falling to the pirate paternalists of Mycenae, who with advances in shipbuilding and uh, an economic base built on grain were beginning to conquer the eastern Mediterranean. And one by one, the last bastions of the, of the uh, goddess religion were falling. There were also great earthquakes in the eastern Mediterranean at this time, which also contributed to the disruption of this civilization. And the story that I want to tell is a story that uh, occurs from the very oldest stratum of Greek mythology. This is not about the pantheon of classical or even Doric Greece. This is an older story, Mycenaean, perhaps older than that, going back even to the pastoralists coming out of Africa and into the Fertile Crescent. It's uh, a story set in a setting which is probably familiar to most of you, although this story is only told in Pausanias and alluded to in Herodotus. So it is not some, a story that even classicists are too familiar with. Uh, Robert Graves, in his four-volume study of Greek mythology, gives it only passing reference. You may recall that King Minos was the king of Crete, and that he was most famous for having built a labyrinth in which to house the Minotaur. And I'm sure you know the story of the traversing of the labyrinth. But then comes the story I want to tell, which is uh, a few years later, the king and the queen, apparently under quite normal conditions, conceived a child who was in due time born. And this child's name was Glaucus. Glaucus means blue-gray, and is to this day a term preserved in taxonomy to describe the blue-gray color uh, typical of the peyote cactus and of the bruising reaction of psilocybin mushrooms. A and young Glaucus had the run of the royal palace at Gnosis. And uh, in his sixth year, he was exploring the pantries of the palace. And he uh, discovered a huge urn filled with honey. And he took the lid off the honey urn and was reaching into it and fell into the honey and was drowned and died there. And no one knew what had become of the son of the king and the queen. And there was tumult, as you can imagine, in the court. 
and eventually Queen Pasiphae in a state of complete hysterical distraction uh, went to the great seer who advised the king's generals and the king's weather makers and she said uh, you must find our son and the seer looked into the surface of oils poured on water and burned hyssop leaves and he said my magic is not sufficient to find your son but I can lead you to one who can find your son he said the person and this is the part of the myth which is so bizarre that you suspect that there must be textual corruption or some kind of uh, uh, misunderstanding because it's so weird what follows the seer said the person who can lead you to your son is that person who can compose the most apt simile on the tricolored cow in your herds <laughs> what the tricolored cow is what kind of code language we're dealing with can only be a matter of conjecture but obviously the story at this point is couched in a secret language which conveyed meaning only to the, the initiates so the king and the queen commanded each citizen of the principality to appear before them and compose a simile on the tricolored cow and there was a man there a minor philosopher whose name was polyedos and polyedos you only have to have spent two weeks in greek before you transferred out to something a little less horrifying to know that polyedos means many ideas so polyedos the man of many ideas went before the court and he proposed a simile which according to the account of Pausanias was brilliant he doesn't preserve it and hence it's lost forever but whatever this simile was it carried the day and uh, Polyidos was actually a very humble man a minor healer and magician and he was puzzled that out of all the people in the kingdom he had been chosen or he had by fate been singled out as the one who could solve this extremely racking dilemma of the lost son for the king and queen. Polyidos, once chosen, he dreamed uh -huh. and saw the body Life. in the honey, but they were so flipped out that the kid was dead mm. that the fact that he had found the body didn't buy him much uh, slack. And the queen flew into a rage and said he should be sealed into a crypt with the body of our son and he can come out when he comes out with our son alive and so polyidos was seized by force and notice now the motifs of incarceration, the dark night of the soul, the alchemical enclosing of the prima materia. I mean, this is a rich, rich myth. So Polyidos was seized by force and placed into a crypt that was walled up, and the body of Glaucus was laid beside him on a slab. And as Polyidos sat there bewailing his fate and rending his clothes, and calling out on the gods to help him, a snake entered the chamber through some unseen tiny chink. And the snake approached the corpse of the child lying in a dripping pool of presumably dark attic honey on the polished stone of the sarcophagi. And, uh, and Polyidos emerged out of his reverie and struck out at the snake and killed it because he was afraid it would violate the body of the child. And then, seeing that the snake was dead, he went back to his reverie. And a few minutes later, a second snake appeared and came to the body of the first snake and reacted very violently and before Polyidos could move to catch it 
quick as a wink, it was across the room and lost through a small aperture in the floor. And hours passed, and the depth of Polyidos despair grew and multiplied as he realized the hopelessness of his situation. And then, suddenly, the second snake appeared again. And this time, it was carrying in its mouth a, a branch of a small herb. And it approached the corpse of its companion and regurgitated the branch into the mouth of the dead snake. And the dead snake was revived, and the two snakes went away. struck dumb with amazement. And he called to his jailers, and he described this herb to them, which was well known to him for its use in other medical matters. And the herb was brought to him, and he chewed it up, and he regurgitated it into the mouth of the corpse of young Glaucus. And the child was revived. And Polyidos' ass was saved. <laughs> so he emerged, and the king and the queen were jubilant, and the court was jubilant. And the king said, you can have anything that you wish. And, and, and Polyidos, who was actually a foreigner in Crete, said, I want to journey to my homeland. I want to return to my homeland. And King Minos was on the brink of granting the boon when Queen Pasiphae intervened and whispered in his ear and said, you cannot allow a magician of this power to leave the kingdom. We must somehow gain his knowledge before we allow him to depart from us. And so King Minos backtracked and made a different deal and said, you can return to your homeland, but first you must teach all your magical arts to my son Glaucus, who you have resurrected. And so Polyidos, not liking it, but seeing the power of the king, acceded to the demand. And over the course of many years, he taught all his shamanic and magical arts to Glaucus, and he schooled him in all of the esoteric knowledge that had made Polyidos the unique person able to recover the, find the lost child. And finally, he went to the king and said, I have taught all I know to your son. Now fulfill your promise and allow me to leave your kingdom. And so the king was agreed. And on the appointed day of departure, uh, a royal retinue accomplish, accompanied Polyidos to the quay, where he was to grab the boat out to Syracuse. And uh, they were embracing, and the last goodbyes were being said. And finally, it only remained for Polyidos to make his departure to Glaucus. And he approached Glaucus. And he said, as, as my pupil, as the one that I have initiated, I have one last request. It is that now at our farewell, you spit into my mouth. And Glaucus thought it was a bizarre request, but he did as his master bade him. And Polyidos boarded the ship and they cast off and sailed away. And as the royal family was standing at, on the quay looking out to sea, Glaucus realized that all the magical information that had been given to him over the years had been contained in the glob of spittle, and that the master had reclaimed his knowledge and uh, <laughs> sailed away. <laughs> so that's the story of uh, Glaucus and Polyidos. Now the reason, let me say a little bit about it, uh, is a very interesting story. Uh, 
I found it while I was searching for proto-Hellenic uh, myths related to mushrooms. And the, there's something funny going on in this story. The fact that the blue-gray child is preserved in the honey and then is resurrected through the intercession of another herb, an herb known to the snake. And recall from the Genesis myth that the snake is always the keeper of the vegetable secrets. It was the snake who had the inner skinny on the flora and fauna of Eden. And uh, so the snake comes bearing information that then concerns this herb of immortality and the ability to resurrect the dead. And uh, it shows, I think, the very late persistence of these Paleolithic sh uh, themes of shamanic power uh, carried and transmitted through, through plants. If any of you have any other insight into this, why perhaps in the afternoon. Glaucus may have been uh, uh, eaten a mushroom and gone into some kind of coma state where he appeared dead. Um, and uh, uh, then the task was to revive him. So they found an herb that restores people who are apparently dead. In the, in the Gilgamesh story, there's also an herb of immortality that, that the snake absconds with. And the snakes have always been the especially credited with knowing the secret of regeneration because of their sloughing their skin and all that. Well, you know, people in Mexico who go to Watla and places like that and collect the mushroom, the on-the-road, old-style way of preserving the mushrooms was honey. to put them in honey. And it turns into a totally black mess. It turns into the alchemical prima materia. It turns into the exudate of the grave. Mm. But if you have the courage to eat it, it is then reborn inside mm. of you.